Thank you very much. First of all, I, I feel very humbled. I know that's an odd thing for a politician to say, <laughs> but I feel humbled to be here after the magnificent speakers you've had before me and what they've done to overcome and what they've done to fully integrate themselves in society. Weren't they magnificent? <laughs> Wonderful. Wow. I ask how many people, oh, I ask how many people were here who were deaf. I thought maybe I'd give my speech in sign language. No. <laughs> Very slow. <laughs> I just said I thought about giving my speech in sign language, but I forgot many signs and I'm very slow. <laughs> so I'll let my interpreter. Uh, first, let me thank Feroz. I first met him last year in Washington, D.C., and then I read about him and read about what he was doing and about this inclusion summit. I couldn't come last year, uh, but I wanted to make sure that I had uh, my schedule right to, to be here this year. What he has done has just been fantastic. I just, I want to say this about Feroz. If, if we had more executives in businesses all around the globe that had the empathy, the compassion, the drive for an inclusion society like Feroz, what a wonderful world we'd live in today. I wish we could mold him, make copies <laughs> around the globe. Let me tell you a story, and then I'll close with a kind of a moral of the story. Uh, I had a brother who was deaf, and so uh, whenever we'd watch television, of course, in the early days, he never knew what was going on, and we'd have to kind of interpret for him. Uh, in 1978, um, someone had invented a box, a set-top box that goes on a television. It was great big. It was like a, an old VCR, if any of you know what that was. I delivered the first one to President Jimmy Carter in the White House. And then I got one for my brother. But in, that, in those days, the only way you could get decoding for closed captions, that's what it was. It was a box so you could get closed captions across the screen, was it could only be done if a program was taped before, then you sent it someplace, they put in all the words, and then you'd show it. So the only programs on television were those that were taped before to be shown later. So there are very few. But my brother enjoyed it. He finally got to watch some TV, and, and, and so we did this and we set up a, a place to do the interpreting. And my whole idea was do it for deaf people. 10 years later, I was visited by a person who worked in the chip business, who told me that then, this is 1988, uh, that they could take what was in that big box and put it on a chip the size of your thumbnail for a TV set. I said, that's amazing. So, because I chaired the Committee on Disability, I had hearings on it. I brought in the TV manufacturers. Well, yes, they realized that could be done, but it was going to cost a lot of money. <laughs> cost a lot of money. How much? Oh, they said maybe $200 per television. I said, gee, well, that's, that's, that's a lot. So I got my friend in the chip business. I said, is it true that this will cost $200 per television? He said, well, yes if you make a hundred of them, or if you make a thousand of them. But he said, if you make millions of them, it costs a few pennies. So I thought about this. So I introduced a bill that I got through that mandated that every television set sold in America 
after five years that had a screen of 13 inches or bigger, but there was a technical problem for smaller television. But I mandated that every television that sold America had to have that chip in it. So, so um, I thought it would take a long time. It would take 10, 15, 20 years for this to really happen. Uh, Bill Marriott, the head of Marriott Hotels, heard Marriott Hotels, uh, decided that they were going to throw out all their TVs and put these new ones in all their hotels. Wow, that was big. But what happened is then the other hotels decided they needed to do the same thing. <laughs> so in about, I would say maybe five, seven years, they were all over the place. And, um, and now they're, they're global, every, every television set has. And you know what the ex extra cost is for a television now with that chip? It's not even a factor in the price. It's so cheap it's not even a factor in the price. So I then began to see things happen. I don't know if you have them here in India, but in America we have what we call sports bars. People go in and they have a television here that shows a football game and another football game and then maybe a basketball game and cricket. No, nah, not much cricket. <laughs> um, that kind of soccer. And it's very noisy. People are drinking beer and watching the sports. So they all have the subtitles coming across it so you can follow your sports team. Then I saw schools were using them to teach children different languages. So we have a lot of Latino kids, Latina kids in America. For them, English was a second language. Here now they could watch a program in Spanish and see the English. So it was a teaching tool. Wow. And then I introduced legislation to mandate that all captioning had to be real time. That's when you watch news today, you can see their captions. So you see, I thought at the beginning that this was only for people with deafness, but I found out everybody likes it. How many of you, with a television, you're watching the news, phone rings, you answer the phone, and it's someone you want to talk to, you don't want to miss it, so you punch the mute button, and you can carry on your phone call and watch what the news says. I do it myself all the time. So what I thought was just for deaf people now becomes something for everybody, for everybody. And so I have a cartoon that I'd like to show you. I hope I can bring it up here. They tell me technically they can do it, but let's see what happens here. I don't know. Uh, it's a cartoon that kind of illustrates uh, what I'm talking about. And uh, we'll see if this works. Well, I don't know, can you, can you see that? Now, this is a, a schoolhouse, and there's a lot of snow. Now, I know you, a lot of you don't know what snow is, but let me describe it. <laughs> it's solid rain, and it's cold. Where I live, we have a lot of it. And so there's a lot of snow, and the stairs, and here's a kid in a wheelchair, and here's all the other kids, and here's the school custodian. And so the kid in the wheelchair says, could you please shovel the ramp? The custodian says, all these other kids are waiting to use the stairs. When I get through shoveling them off, then I will clear the ramp for you. The kid in the wheelchair says, but if you shovel the ramp, we can all get in. Clearing a path for people with special needs clears the path for everyone. And so I want to kind of close on this, and it has to do with what the singer, Krishna, who's very good, by the way, um, said this when he was talking about inclusion, about he had a problem with that, about who am I to include somebody? That's not the point. 
if someone doesn't like me and doesn't want me in their house or in their car with them, that's okay. That's okay. If they're prejudiced against me, that, that's fine. I, I can take that. But I also know one other thing. People are not born with prejudice. They learn it. And so if this person doesn't like me, there's probably something he heard about me, or she heard about me, from somebody that caused them not to like me. Okay, fine. What we're talking about is not that. What we're talking about is what causes the prejudice in the first place. Why are so many people prejudiced against people with disabilities? Because that's how they've been taught. They grew up in a society that built structures that segregated people with disabilities outside. They constructed a society all over that said it's us and them. It's us and them. That's wrong. That's wrong. You see, people don't fit into two distinct categories. Uh, people with disabilities and people without disabilities. That's not it. You see, we all fall on a spectrum all the way around. We fall on a spectrum, not two distinct camps. And so inclusion has to do not with, not with me including somebody. It has to do with breaking down both the physical barriers, the attitudinal barriers of those who are in power and who make these constructs to break them down so that we don't segregate people out in our society. And then, then kids will grow up and they'll see everybody all included and they won't have those prejudices anymore. So that's what, to me, inclusion society is. It's breaking down these artificial barriers. It's clearing the path, well, they took it away. It's clearing the path for people with special needs, which helps everyone, helps everyone. And that's what I think about as an inclusion society. When we construct barriers of accessibility and accommodation, barriers to education, barriers to what this young woman said about being yourself and following your dreams and being able to do what you want to do, not what society tells you to do, but what you want to do. When you break those down, then we become an inclusive, an inclusive society. I'll just close on this. The constructs that we've had about us and them, the artificial barriers that we've constructed in so many ways, from education, transportation, housing, medicine, so many ways we've constructed these artificial barriers. You see, to, to, to accept that and to say that's just the way it is and we have to live with it, that's morally wrong. That's morally wrong. What's morally correct is to say, you know, it's not us and them, it's me. It's all of us. You see, we all know we may be one illness, one accident away, and then we fall someplace else on that spectrum, don't we? Hmm? We may fall some, we get older. I can't hear worth a darn. So now I'm a little bit on that spectrum. I need sometimes sign language, or I need subtitles <laughs> to understand what's going on. So all of us during our lifetimes will fall someplace on that spectrum. So, the morally correct, the politically correct, the societal, societal correct thing to do is for us to engage in breaking down those barriers and to tell designers of the future, to tell designers of the future, you must think about your design what you're building to include everyone. The disability community in America has a saying, nothing about us without us. 
Nothing about us without it. One last thing. If I go to London today, every taxi cab is fully accessible. Not here, not in Washington, D.C., not in New York City. We're trying to get some of them. I'm told that within maybe 12 years, there will be more driverless cars on the road than there are cars with drivers. It's happening. It's going to happen very rapidly. Well, this could be a wonderful thing for a lot of people with disabilities, people with cerebral palsy, uh, people who are sight impaired, other kinds of uh, mobility impairment. Wow, you can call up a car, come pick you up, take you wherever you want to go. It'll only happen if the cars are designed from the very beginning to be fully accessible. And it can be done. It's not that hard. Hell, if they can do it in London cabs, they can do it anywhere. And so that's what I mean about we have to be on the cutting edge. We have to be pushing, demanding that when a new building is built, it is built fully accessible, universal design. When we're going to have new transportation systems, it must be designed for everyone. When we have medical systems that reach out to take care of people that, that are ill, it has to be to include everyone, including persons with disabilities. So that's my message. It's morally correct, it's politically correct, and you know what else it is? I could ask Ferocious, he's a business person, I'll ask all the business people too. It's economically correct too, because it is the best economic thing you can do. So, thank you for having me here. I think you're doing wonderful things. Um, I went outside the other day, I'm, this is my first time in Bangalore. Not my first time in India, but my first time in Bangalore. So I went outside and I walked a thousand meters down the street that way and a thousand meters down that way. And I thought, how do I get across the street? <laughs> I saw some things where I thought, I kind of like to go over there, but I couldn't find any way across the street. <laughs> then I saw brave people sort of getting in and out of the cars. <laughs> I thought, I'm not that brave. And in the middle, there was a kind of a median in the middle, but it had a big high step up like that. I said, what? How would a person using a wheelchair ever get across that street? How would someone who used crutches ever get across that street? I was scared to death myself to go out on that street. So, so, universal design. I can tell you that when you put up crosswalks with signs that speak to you, you push a button, it says, wait, wait, wait. If you're vision impaired, then it clicks on, it says you can go. When you do that, I can tell you, it won't just help vision impaired, it will help everybody. It'll help every elderly person that maybe isn't as quick as some of you younger people, okay? That can weave in and out of traffic and things like that. So. We've got a lot of work to do. Let's go to work, let's go to work, okay? Thank you.